My main point is to note that we often think of environmental problems as principally technological in nature, and we often propose technological solutions to them. And in fact, ironically, uh, a lot of times the green technologies, quote unquote green technologies we develop, actually make problems worse. And in particular, one of the most common ways that's advocated to help uh, deal with global warming, uh, conserve resources, is to improve the efficiency with which we use resources. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that improving efficiency, uh, ironically, actually increases use of resources. Um, so I'm going to sneak up on that point, though, here by starting with a, a, an appropriate event that fits in with a, a timing for maybe some people in the audience, maybe some people were we even here at the U of O, that in um, October 30th, uh, 1961, so nearly 51 years ago, the largest bomb ever uh, detonated on Earth was tested by the Soviet Union just north of the Arctic Circle. It's called the Tsar bomb. And it uh, had a yield of 50 megatons. Now, that was more than 10 times the explosive force of all bombs used in World War II. Um, it created enough heat that a person standing 100 kilometers away would have gotten third degree burns. Uh, it was actually detonated high up in the atmosphere, so most of its energy went into space. But the force it generated was equivalent of about 1 point, or 8.1 on the Richter scale. And at shock waves that hit down toward the Earth, they actually did create a seismic shock that could still be detected on its third passage around the surface of the Earth. So this was an, an immensely powerful bomb. And now we kind of come to the paradox. This bomb has been described both as the cleanest nuclear bomb ever detonated and as the dirtiest. And both of those are true in a certain sense. Um, in the sense of being the dirtiest, uh, it, it emitted something on the order of 100 times the nuclear fallout of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So it, it, it emitted a great deal of, of nuclear fallout. However, it was a hydrogen bomb principally. So it was where a, fu a fission bomb sets off a fusion reaction. And in fact, fusion itself is clean. It does not actually emit any radioactive waste. And 97% of the energy came from fusion. It's just you need the fission bomb to trigger it, and the fission bomb is dirty. So while it produced 100 times the nuclear fallout of Hiroshima, it generated 3,000 times the explosive force. So it's an, an example of an extremely efficient bomb, in a sense, as far as nuclear waste to explosive power. But still, it produces a great deal of nuclear waste in an absolute sense. So now we come to something more directly uh, for the theme I'm going to talk about here that, that fits with this. And I'll, I'll go back to the 19th century when the economist William Stanley Jevons was studying uh, the history of coal use by industry. And he noted this strange phenomenon, a paradox that we today name after him as the Jevons paradox, that early in the industrial era, uh, when they were perfecting steam engines, as steam engines became more and more efficient, Paradoxically, coal use increased. Now, the reason for that may not be so surprising if you consider the fact that when early steam engines were developed, they took immense amounts of coal to do anything. So industrialists did not ever invest in using them. It was only when they became more and more efficient that they became appealing to substitute for human labor and production processes. So, the efficiency of the steam engine led to the vastly wider adoption of steam engines and therefore the vastly wider consumption of coal. Uh, so now I come to a thought experiment that I think might best illustrate how this paradoxical effect can happen. And I'll just ask you to imagine two hypothetical alternative worlds. Uh, picture one world in which every car in the world we have is converted to a very efficient one. Right? So say hypothetically, every car that exists today is replaced by the equivalent of a Toyota Prius that gets 50 miles to the gallon. So we eliminate all these giant SUVs, all these cars to get ter terrible gas mileage. Now compare that in your head to another hypothetical world in which every car is replaced by an extremely inefficient one. And I'll make it the inverse of that scenario, where instead of getting 50 miles to the gallon, every car takes 50 gallons of gasoline to go one mile. So you have this huge contrast, right? In fact, a 2,500-fold difference in efficiency. 
50 gallons to the mile versus 50 miles to the gallon. Now, one of the nice things about a thought experiment is you can't prove me wrong. So I'll, I have that as my backup. But I'm hoping I could convince you that in that world with the extremely inefficient car, you'd have a lot less gasoline use. Well, I could point out the one obvious thing is it'd be extremely in a, ineffective to fit a gas tank to a car uh, that could let it travel very far if you needed 50 gallons of gas to go one mile. But I'd also just like you to think about gas prices. At current gas prices, it would cost $200 to drive one mile. If it cost $200 to drive one mile, uh, might I propose that maybe people wouldn't drive very much at all? And in fact, we would have developed the world very differently. We would have formed communities in which people could get around by walking or biking. We would have very different social expectations about mobility. Um, so I would say that, in fact, one of the reasons we use so much gasoline in cars is due to their efficiency rather than their inefficiency. Now, I'll come actually directly to what I actually study most directly. I'm interested in looking at national economies and what they do when they develop. When you get economic growth, what happens? And I'll tell you that a phenomena similar to what I noted about this strange thing of, of this fusion bomb that's both the dirtiest and the cleanest bomb, and the Jevons paradox where these inefficient or these efficient steam engines make us use more coal. Something like that actually happens when economies grow typically. When they develop, they tend to both increase how much fossil fuel they use, but they also become much more efficient at it at the same time. I think a, a prime example of this is China. Many of you may have heard that uh, about six years ago, China passed the United States to emit the most carbon dioxide of any nation on Earth from fossil fuel use. And that's kind of the first time since these records have ever been kept that any nation emitted more carbon dioxide than the US. And in fact, China increased its carbon dioxide emissions five-fold in 30 years. Since 1980, five-fold increase. And that's not principally due to population growth, because China had really reduced its fertility rates. So it doesn't have a very rapid population growth. So in fact, it improved and increased per capita emissions more than three and a half-fold. Now, here's that paradox coming up then. The irony is over that time, China became one of the most efficient nations in the world. In fact, it invested more in solar power, wind power, hydropower than most other nations. And that led it to improve the carbon efficiency of its economy. That is to say, how much carbon dioxide is emitted per dollar, or in the case of China, per, per yuan, threefold. So said another way, today China emits one third the carbon dioxide per dollar than it did a mere 30 years ago. So China had this, this pattern that actually is quite common throughout the industrial era, where economies are both getting more and more efficient while they're emitting more and more carbon dioxide and generally using more and more resources. Now, the reasons for that are complicated in the case of nations. I mean, there, there are many factors at an aggregate level like that, and I wouldn't give one reason. But part of the reason is a likely a connection along the lines that Jevons noted for the steam engine, that improving efficiency of resource use is also an economic strategy to improve profitability. If you use fewer resources to produce something, you make more money at it. That leads more money to invest in expanding production and more money to invest in increasing extraction of natural resources and use. So a lot of what efficiency does is it makes it possible to greatly expand resource consumption itself. So I would then kind of end by summarizing this with a sociological point. Um, it's not to say that green technologies aren't important and couldn't in principle help address environmental problems. It's that we really need to ask a, partly a social question of how the application of a technology plays out in social, political, and economic contexts. And in fact, there are often counterintuitive things that happen in those contexts where you don't actually find some straightforward effect because of interactions and feedback. Thank you very much, everyone. It was good to talk to you.